Good morning. Nice to see you again. Uh, a couple of notices before we begin worship. Uh, World Day of Prayer service will be held on Friday the 4th of March at 2 p.m. in the church hall. That's Friday the 4th of March in the hall, 2 o'clock. And they all are welcome at the service which has been prepared by women from England, Wales and Northern Ireland. And then I'm, you'll be sorry to hear I've been asked to intimate the passing of David Grant, who was a former session clerk at Falkland, and he apparently he used to sing in the choir here. The funeral service will take place here in Fruhey Parish Church next Friday, next Friday, 9.45 a.m. And we commend his family to God's comfort. Let us worship God. We sing together hymn 44, Psalm 65. Praise waits for thee in Zion, Lord. Though we are bound to you by many ties, 
We recognize that in our lives there's restlessness, there's anxiety, and there's fear. If these arise because we reject your leading and wander from your way, we ask you to give us now the honesty to admit our failings and the courage to repent of them. Hear us therefore as we pray, Lord have mercy. Christ have mercy. Lord have mercy. May we each be assured that there is declared in Jesus Christ to all who are truly penitent, forgiveness of their sins and the renewal of their lives in the power of his spirit. Lord God, Christ's dealings with our human race have shown the power of love. Establish such a love within our hearts that we may love you in sincerity and for Christ's sake, love and care for all men and women through the same Jesus Christ our Lord, in whose words we pray together, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our first scripture lesson this morning is from the Old Testament, from the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. And this will be read for us by Baptist. Hear the word of God. The pleasures are meaningless. I thought in my heart, come now, I will test you with pleasure to find out what is good. But that also proved to be meaningless. Laughter, I say, is foolish. And what does pleasure accomplish? I tried cheating myself with wine and embracing folly. My mind still guided me with wisdom. I wanted to see what was worthwhile for men to do under heaven during the few days of their lives. I undertook great projects. I built houses for myself and planted vineyards. I made gardens and parks and planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made reservoirs to water groves of flourishing trees. I bought male and female slaves and had other slaves who were born in my house. I also owned more herds and flocks than anyone in Jerusalem before me. I amassed silver and gold for myself and the treasure of kings and provinces. I acquired men and women singers and a harem as well, the delights of the hearts of man. I became greater by far than anyone in Jerusalem before me. In all this, my wisdom stayed with me. I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my work, and this was the reward for all my labor. Yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done, and what I had to toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. Thanks be to God for this reading from the Holy Word. And thank you, Babs. We sing now in 125, Lord of all being, throne afar. One, two, five.
we read again in the New Testament this time, in the Gospel according to St. Mark, chapter 10, at verse 17. Mark 10 and 17. As Jesus was starting on a journey, a stranger ran up to him and kneeling before him asked, Good Master, what must I do to win eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one's good except God alone. You know the commandments, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false evidence, do not defraud, honour your father and mother. But Master, he replied, I've kept all these since I was a boy. Jesus looked straight at him, his heart walked to him, and he said, One thing you lack, go sell everything you have and give it to the poor, and you will have riches in heaven. And come follow me. At these words his face fell and he went away with a heavy heart. For he was a man of great wealth. Amen and may God bless to us these readings from his word. To his name be the glory and the praise. Now our prayers of thanksgiving and intercession let us pray. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God, because it is always right to praise Him and to thank Him. Father, we thank You for our experience of the world, the world You have created, for the sights and sounds of every day, and for the occasional glimpses into deeper beauty and into glory. For the many encounters and acquaintanceships of life and for the deeper and more lasting relationships we have with one another, with those whom we love and those who love us. But more than all of that, Father, we thank you again for the Gospel's joyful sound, for the new light Christ gives to those who put their trust in him and for the privilege of our commission to speak in his name, to shine with his light, and to build his new community. To the great company of his servants in both earth and heaven, we join our voices to praise you, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the highest. And now, Lord God, we pray you to fan the flame of love in our hearts and give warmth to the words of our lips and the thoughts of our minds as we pray for others. Lord, King and Head of the Church, we remember every congregation of the faithful, strengthen their confidence in your power and will to save the human race and in the final triumph of your kingdom. Lord of Lords, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, remember the rulers of the nations, especially Elizabeth our Queen, her governments and all members of our parliaments. Let it be the aim of every government to promote peace and justice and let the causes of hatred and bitterness be removed from all the troubled places of the world especially in these days of tension between Russia and the East and Ukraine. Lord King of Mercy, remember all who are afflicted, those sick in body and disturbed in mind, the worried and the tempted, the bereaved, all refugees and victims of war and famine and oppression. Give comfort and help, healing and strength. And Lord, King of love, remember all those who are closest to us in our families and in our friendships. And be near to all whom we know to need our prayers, those, how, those whom we now name in a moment of silence 
before. May you be known as King, Lord, in every home and in every heart. And may the whole earth resound with one cry from pole to pole, praise and honour and glory and might to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. And ere we conclude our prayers, we remember the faithful departed, those whom we have loved and yet still love. Praise you for those who have passed in faith from this mortal life across the stream of death. And we pray you also to keep us in strong faith that in the end we may all be reunited in the eternal church in heaven through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom together with you the Father and the Spirit, one God, in glory, majesty, dominion and praise forever and ever. Amen. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Him 6, 4, 1.
Prince Sir John Benjamin, the poet laureate, the swine. The city of Glasgow, of course, my native city. I had driven down the E9 from there, and I was almost at the city boundary, around steps, for those of you who know these parts. The traffic lights ahead of me had changed to amber and then red. And of course, law abiding as I am, I stopped. Everyone else was through, but I stopped. And soon the traffic began to build up behind me. Stop that lights. And then a strange thing happened. After all the traffic from the right had joined the main Glasgow Road, the lights for us changed to red and amber, and then to red and green. Red and green. What shall I do? I thought. As I was first in line to move off, the incident happened a while ago, but as I recall, I was being urged on by honking, impatient drivers behind me, and I can't stand impatient drivers. Carefully, I proceeded through the red and green light to the safety of the holy city. But I was in quite a quandary in that situation. What shall I do? How often have you asked that question? How often have you addressed it either to yourself or to someone else? It's one we all ask at some time in the course of our lives. Sometimes we ask it calmly when we come up against a problem, the nature of which demands careful thought and consideration. What shall I do? Sometimes it's a question we ask when we are gripped by distress or by fear. What shall I do? And on the other hand, there are times when we find ourselves in a situation where we have to decide clearly between two courses of action. The issue isn't quite as simple as that. It isn't clear cut, perhaps. And we have difficulty in deciding which is the right line to take. So in uncertainty, we ask, what shall I do? The quotation has been posed generation after generation since the beginning of time. It's one which is asked countless times in the Bible. And it might profit us to examine a few of the occasions, a few of the occasions in the New Testament on which it was asked, and to discover how the question was ultimately answered. What shall I do? Jesus was asked that I may inherit eternal life. Our first occasion for consideration. Of course, you well remember Jesus' answer to that rich young man who asked it. He read the story there in Mark. If you want to get, you must give. If you want to get, you must give up everything you have and follow me. That's what you must do. The question was asked quickly and answered. But the young man in question didn't like the answer he got, and as a result, the Gospel account concludes with these pathetic words. His face fell, and he went away with a heavy heart, for he was a man of great wealth. He asked a familiar question, he received the answer, but no, he didn't like the answer, so away he went, and that's the last we hear of him. The last we hear of a man who may well had his attitude been different have gained a place in the annals of history as a disciple of Jesus. But let's not lash out at this young man. That could be foolish. Don't we all sometimes react in the same way? We ask for guidance in a certain situation, guidance from those in authority. We are shown the way we unmistakably ought to take. And in our innermost hearts, we 
know full well what we ought to do. But we don't like that particular way. And so we turn our backs on the clear guidance we have received and we go off in our own direction. Many people complain that their prayers are never answered. Many people turn to the authority of authorities and ask, what shall I do? And then complain that no answer to the question has been forthcoming. I wonder, however in truth, how many have clearly received an answer from God but have failed to act upon it because they didn't like God's answer. Before we complain about unanswered prayer, should we ask ourselves if we have truly accepted the guidance God has given us? The second occasion on which the question is asked is asked again by a rich man in Luke's Gospel, chapter 12 in fact. This time, not a young man, but a man who had reached retiring age. He had spent all his life working and money making very successfully. And so he, as he did his stock taking one day, and as he viewed with a feeling of great satisfaction his plentiful crops and his packed full bars, he asked the question, what shall I do? I don't have the space to store my produce. He'd clearly been a slick businessman, well used to making momentary decisions. Thus, almost as soon as he had asked the question, he thereupon answered it himself. This I will do. I will pull down my storehouses, my barns, I'll build them even bigger, and then I'll say to myself, man, you've had, a pl you've had plenty of good things laid by now, enough for many years. So take life easy, chill out, eat, drink and be merry. This man didn't even ask God for guidance. What shall I do? He reckoned that he was perfectly able to answer the question himself. After all, he had lived his successful life without any thought of God, and now having amassed a fortune, he certainly wasn't going to ask God how he should spend it. What shall I do? This shall I do. He knew it all himself. His plans were to retire and to live a life of luxury and ease, but he had made one big mistake. He failed to include God in his calculations. Of course, this man's Paul Saga is just a New Testament version of the pessimistic, skeptical preacher of the teacher, his name was Cola, and uh, of whom Babs read to us in that Old Testament book of Ecclesiastes. He too opted for the self-answered question. The passage begins, I said to myself, eat, drink, and be merry. In his wisdom, in his own wisdom, he had denied himself nothing. Great possessions, pleasure, food, drink, all of his. He plunged into his pleasures, as we heard in the story. He did great things. He planted great vineyards and gardens. In his wisdom, he had amassed cattle and silver and gold in abundance. In fact, without his eyes coveted, he had refused them nothing. Nothing. But in the end, Everything was to no avail. None of his one-time cherished possessions had brought him any satisfaction. Quote, when I turned and reviewed all my handiwork, all my labour, all my toil, I saw that everything was emptiness and chasing the wind, of no profit under the sun. The passage ended. Like the rich man of whom Jesus told, the preacher, the teacher who penned the pages of Ecclesiastes, he too at this point had left God out of his calculations. And surely God said to him, as he said to the man in Jesus' story, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. In the sight of God, both of them remained pitiful paupers. Again, before we condemn these two characters, let us certain whether we always seek divine guidance when faced with a problem, or do we 
rely on our own cleverness, our own ability. Do we, in all our plans for the future, take God into account? If we don't, maybe all our schemes and efforts will be in vain. If we have decided on some future course of action in our own minds, and yet in all our planning have left God out, then let us be warned. One day we may hear that same voice rebuke us, thou fool. What shall I do? The question. It's important to whom the question is addressed, but it's equally important how we act on receiving an answer. Which leads conveniently to the last incident we have time to examine this morning, where this question is asked. And this time by a very frightened man, a tough guy, a hard man. No wonder his job was that of jailer in the city of Philippi. And men who did that kind of job were well, usually chosen for the warm hearted, sympathetic disposition. The previous night he had been entrusted, this jailer, with the care of two VIPs, very important prisoners, Paul and Silas. And to ensure that they wouldn't escape, they were thrown down into the innermost dungeon, their feet securely uh, fettered in stocks. Having satisfied himself that the prisoners were down for the night, the jailer went to bed himself. But again, this man had left God out of his calculations during the night, an earthquake erupted. The foundations of the prison shaken from their roots. The prisoners free. Their fetters truly unfastened. The doors blasted wide. With a look of fright on this scene of chaos and of security systems devastated, a terrified jailer calls out, What shall I do? Assuming the prisoners had escaped, the jailer in effect was about to draw his sword with the intention of falling on it. Who knew what the repercussions would be for himself? Do yourself no harm, shouted Paul, we're all here. Calling for lights, the totally stunned and bewildered jailer rushed in and threw himself down prostrate and mercilessly before Paul and Silas, trembling with fear. And then he humbly asked them, What must I do, masters, to be saved? And then came the reply, that memorable reply, which ever since has been blazed abroad, whether in Bibles, on bill posters, even in neon lights. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. What shall I do? That, in fact, is the world's question. And that illustrious text is still the answer to society's problems. Nothing safe, nothing sure, as we well know in these confusing, unsettling days. Nothing is sound or soft. The foundations of society have been dangerously shaken and are imminently near to collapse, not only by threats and attacks of terrorists of the world and by aggressive nations, but by the continual and constant erosion and demolition of matters moral and spiritual. Principles which at one time not so very long ago were of great concern in terms of upholding them. Principles relating to national life, family life, even to church life. Many of them don't really matter all that much now in this contemporary postmodern enlightened age in which we are living. Deep down we see our problems are essentially moral and spiritual. So what's the answer? Where indeed is the answer to 
to a note. It is clearly there in the context of the words Jesus uttered to his disciples on the mountainside as he prepared them to go out into all the world. As we sang pre sermon Seek ye first the kingdom of God. It's a matter of priorities. Problems of the world will never be solved as long as we continue to put first things second. It's only when we primarily and earnestly seek God's kingdom, giving ethical and moral and spiritual issues prime place, it's only then that the other things can and will be added unto us. So, what shall we do? Seek first the kingdom of God and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what to do. Glory be to you, O God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and evermore shall be world without end. Amen. And now, after a delightful organ voluntary, I will dedicate the box. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, our King and our God, we have come to your house on this day to worship you. We have come to seek first the Kingdom of God in our worship, in our prayers, in our prayers, as we have studied your Word. And now seeking to further your kingdom, we offer our gifts to be used by the church, to extend the church and to build the church here and throughout your world. Accept these gifts of money, together with the love and service of our lives and our hearts, that the kingdom may be established and the kingdom may stand and grow forever to all God's creatures on his sway. Amen.
Him for some free thy kingdom come, on bended knee the passing ages pray. Inspire you and distress the all around. 